Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a program for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work, both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes, or to suggest a particular topic or guest you would like to hear featured on the program. You can also engage with us through Twitter and Facebook. We would love to hear from you. And now, here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to his friends as Mags. Hi, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Global Missions Podcast. And if you're listening for the very first time, a very special welcome to you. Our guest today is Tiffany Godby, who serves with Greater Europe Mission, and we'll be discussing what is sometimes a significant barrier for an individual or for a family following the call to serve in missions. When a family member or members are not supportive, they're not on board for that missionary call. We'll be talking about some of the reasons for this barrier and how to help prepare and support both those going and those staying at home. Before we get to the interview with Tiffany, we'd like to share with you this missions resource. Do you know a missionary kid returning to Canada this summer? Reboot is a week-long retreat for MKs that helps them to process their transition and connect with other MKs experiencing the same changes. Visit www.canadianmk.net to learn more about Reboot camps happening this July and August in Calgary, Alberta, and Kitchener, Ontario. And now, here's today's interview. Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome to today's interview on the Global Missions Podcast. Our guest today is Tiffany Godby who is the Director of Internships and Mobilization Team Coordinator at Greater Europe Mission. Sounds like two different hats, Tiffany. Yes, it's two of the many, it feels like, but definitely two solid hats on. Okay. Tiffany and her husband, Rule, live in Monument, Colorado, and we're glad to welcome you to the program. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being invited. Our topic today is a sensitive one, a little bit delicate, but a really important one. We've entitled it Following God's Call When Your Family Isn't On Board. And we want to sensitively, with great care and respect, unpack this topic a little bit. When there is a worker or workers, they're believing God is calling to serve in global missions, but around them they have loved ones who just aren't fully convinced or aren't on board fully. Tiffany, we were talking about sometimes this is parents who express these reservations, but we've also experienced this in our agency when an older couple, maybe near retirement or semi-retired, something like that, goes to the mission field. And it's actually kids who are expressing the reservations as well. That's true. Yeah, we've seen that as well. So we want to think together about this just before we do, though. uh, Tiffany, would you just tell us a bit about yourself and your work in mobilization and helping new workers get ready to go? Sure, absolutely. Um, Well, I've been with Greater Europe Mission for about five years or so. Originally, God had called my family, I have four kids, as well as my husband, Rule, to serve in Ireland. We had a real passion to reach the people there with a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. However, along the way, as God often does, he redirects us. And so now I work at headquarters here in Monument, Colorado, and um, have been blessed to take on the internship program within the last year to really get 18 to 25-year-olds who uh, want to, as I love to say, taste and see that the Lord is good, that He can provide in missions. And so I work with them getting placements around Europe. And then um, my mobilization team coordinator is kind of the whole enchilada. It's the big part. I work with the director of mobilization, and we look at all ages, groups, and all links of service, um, getting them to serve all across Europe. So yeah. Very good. Helpful summary. And just a shout out to Greater Europe Mission, or GEM as we sometimes call it. And to, uh, I'm just going to mention Howard Moore, a friend in the ministry who has served so faithfully with GEM Canada as well. Just appreciate serving together with this organization. Tiffany, many organizations like GEM and others are concerned about barriers to raising up and sending out new workers. We have seen different authors create articles and even books on how parents or other family members are a significant barrier when it comes to moving overseas in answering God's call. Are you finding this to be true? That's a bit anecdotal, but you're a mobilization coordinator. Is this a common barrier? Yeah, actually, it's more common than I think we realize. Sometimes, especially with our young adults, we definitely get the, hey, my parents are really worried about X or 
um, hey, my parents have been asking me a lot of questions. But we've also seen it in um, the older groups as well. Like you said, older adults whose kids don't want them to go or maybe a young a married couple with a baby and how dare you take my grandchild, you know, to another continent where I can't love on them all the time. Parents though, in working with internships, there's definitely probably more of a barrier there than we realize in the sense that a lot of times we'll have an applicant go through the process, maybe even get placed to the point of placement and starting to raise funds. And we get the uh, you know, hey, I, I really don't know if God has called me to this or, you know, something's come up and I just need to not go right now. And oftentimes we've realized that earlier in the conversation or in the application, parents were asking a lot of questions. We even get a lot of direct questions from parents around the intern or the young adults back, you know, not necessarily maybe not letting them know at all, but a direct email or phone call from a parent. So it definitely is a barrier that we deal with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a perception that money is in the way. And of course, that is a reservation and or even a barrier for some raising support to serve in global mission. That's a topic for another day. But you've even suggested when we were visiting before that sometimes that's offered as the uh, it's the upfront reason, but sometimes there's something else behind the scenes. Yeah, no, we we've had people say, you know, I just don't know if I can raise this amount. But then we realized that it's probably the parents pushing. We've we've even had some young adults say, you know, my mom and dad were really concerned that I'm raising money to go over and serve in Europe where I could be saving money for college or, you know, any number of things. And so we've realized that the finance isn't necessarily the issue. It's more the parents' concern. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, as we go on into this conversation, I want to make sure that we stay in a very respectful tone because often these family members, parents are caring people. They are loving their son, their daughter, their families, and they're concerned for good reasons. In some cases, we talk about reaching UPGs, unreached people groups. Sometimes that's located in the 1040 window, which means that it can be a hot climate and it's very crowded and perhaps even unstable in some measures politically even risky. And so we want to treat this topic with real care and respect. And if you're listening and you're a parent of a potential mission worker, I hope you'll sense that as well, that we're not trying to brush this off, but really unpack it with wisdom and with care. Tiffany, what are some of the concerns that you do hear raised when it comes to the parents of mission workers? What are some of the things that they're concerned about? I would say safety is probably the biggest one that we hear. Mm -hmm. Um, There is so much on social media and the news that I understand that they are wanting to have a great story that captures people's attention. But unfortunately, a lot of times it promotes concern, heavy concern on the parents. We've had parents, especially with all the refugees, and that's probably a whole nother topic, coming into Europe and what we're calling the new peoples of Europe. We have a lot of parents that are concerned, you know, hey, I literally had a person one time ask me, do they get off the boat fighting? Do they have guns? No, they're desperate. And so the biggest concern, even in people that we're sending to areas where refugees really aren't going, um, is my child going to be safe? You know, is there a major issue? And one of the things that we talk about is you know, your child is probably safer in this location than going to downtown Chicago. You know, you have to think of it in terms of it's new to them, so it's scary. Mm -hmm. But in reality, a lot of places of Europe are just as safe, if not safer, than many areas of North America. Mm -hmm. The unknown can be scary, for sure. What are some of the other reservations you hear? Just their child going away from them for that long. A lot of times, and I and I don't mean this in a negative sense, but we've kind of coined the, t- the phrase helicopter parents, mm. and that has a lot of different forms. But parents who are used to being with their child or having a say in what they do on a daily or weekly basis, mm-hmm. and then to have that suddenly change is, is scary for a lot of parents. How do I know my son or daughter is eating the right food. You know, how do I know my son or daughter is making the right friends? So just having to separate at that sort of distance 
is scary, particularly when you think about them going all the way over to Europe because they're used to having their child be maybe a single time zone away where they can they can stay on the same routine of connection. However, when they're seven or eight time zones away, that really changes quite a bit. And they don't have the ability to always say goodnight because maybe they're at work and their kid's going to bed. Um, so it really just that distance of time, even though we have this amazing technology, uh, is, is hard. And it's a routine that's really hard for a parent and a child sometimes to get used mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you mentioned technology because that does help. There are means to stay in touch, but there's still that cost of immediate proximity and knowing what's going on and And I think understanding what's going on, sometimes fear can rise up because we don't understand. And that change is very challenging for those staying at home. We've also talked just a little bit about the idea of a normal career. Aren't you going to have a normal career? Shouldn't you get a job and, you know, go to college, get a job and and move on with your life? You've heard that at times as well? I've definitely heard that at times, particularly with young adults who want to do a gap year, perhaps between high school and college. Or even more so if they're doing a gap year after college, you know, parents, wait a second, we just paid for you or we just, you know, really invested in you getting this degree. Why aren't you getting a job like everybody else? Why are you going off to have fun? And really, that's not the point from a lot of the young adults perspective, but that's how parents will often see it. You know, we, we raised you to go to college, to get a good job, to, you know, provide for your family that you're going to have and then take care of us when we're older, you know, and it just really messes with that um, Western mentality of this is the way that it's supposed to go. What's going on. And also, you know, along those lines, I've noticed that because they're thinking of this is the way things have always gone. And this is how I, I had my child's life planned out. I think they know a lot of times that going to Europe is going to change, you know, their child just in the way of which they see the world. But also if they are following Christ to serve in Europe, the church there is very different, even though a lot of North Americans still believe that, well, it's a Christian continent, you know. It's really not. Only about 2% of the population have a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. And that changes a person in worship and in how they view sharing Christ with others. And so I think that's another uh, concern that a lot of parents have is, you know, not only has this changed the plan I had for my child, but this is going to change my child. And am I okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are lordship questions for the goer. I think, and there are lordship questions for the senders as well, and particularly for the families as they participate in that call. Well, let's head into the tension of this discussion then. How can we help those who are called obey God's call while also maintaining that tension of honoring our parents? That's the big concern. And I think that a lot of times this is where it's difficult and why we don't just have a cut answer because it's not a checklist. You know, we absolutely have the commandment of honor your father and your mother. Um, But then we also have, you know, where uh, Jesus had said in in Luke 14, you know, anyone who doesn't hate their father or mother for my name's sake. And then I also think about when Jesus was sitting there talking to the large group and they're like, hey, your your mom and your brothers are outside. Aren't you going to come talk to them? And, And he was like, well, who are my mother? And my brothers, it's those who do my will. And so there's a real tension between that. And we can't say that, hey, everybody who doesn't ignore their parents is not following Christ. And we also can't say everyone who feels that they should honor their parents and stay home isn't following Christ. It really comes down to a discernment and a lot of time in prayer. And that's where I really believe that the church, the local church, the local body of believers that they just do life with really comes into play that they need to be there to pray through these things, not just young adults praying about it and then kind of telling the us older generation what we should think and not, and not just older parents generation, but, you know, saying to the kid, Hey, you know, you're supposed to stay here, but really it's a multi-generational effort that needs to happen in order for each person to discern what the heart is behind don't go. 
That's really good. We're going to come back to more about the body of Christ in this. I'd like to ask for your advice at this point, though, for those mission workers who sense God's call and who may sense that their parents or other family members aren't engaged, aren't on board yet, what advice do you have for them? How can they seek to involve their parents, for example, in the process? I would say the first thing is to be open and honest. I mean, they need to be able to really tell their parents why they're passionate to serve Christ uh, in Europe, in our case, and why they feel God is calling them to do that. Uh, So open communication with parents and open listening. Communication isn't just talking, it's listening as well. So hearing their parents' concerns, trying to understand it, not just be reactionary, but trying to understand where their parents are coming from. Also, each organization works differently. One of the things I love about Greater Europe Mission is we have what we call a member care department. And that department is based and is there to serve our missionaries and our up and coming missionaries with emotional support and spiritual support. So sometimes, you know, we suggest, you know, we would love for you to talk to some of our member care people. We would love for you and your parents to talk to some of our member care people. So I would definitely ask that people research what organization they're looking at going through has to offer in lines of helping them through that. It's a great point. When you look at an organization, what perspective they have for families who remain behind And there are many agencies who want to be supportive here. So if you're hearing this and you have someone interested in missions, make sure you ask these questions. And if you're preparing uh, to go in missions, ask your agency or your church to be helpful along with you. Don't necessarily run it alone and try and uh, carry this. Uh, We can do this as the body. I wonder, Tiffany, if you have advice for those whose parents are not believers. Maybe they're not Christ followers yet. And in some cases, that creates even more distance does. And that's a really tough one. Sometimes it would create a little more distance in the sense of, I don't understand why you believe this way. And you're willing to give up the dreams that I had for you for this God that I don't believe in. If the person believes that this is really going to be a major stumbling block for their parent not to trust in Christ, then they need to give that some really heavy consideration. Is God calling to this despite Or is the ministry that I have being called but staying home for a little while with my parent? On the other side of that, sometimes a non-believing parent who sees the joy and how God provides and what is happening while they're serving is the witness that they need to trust in Christ themselves. There's the two sides of it. And each person, once again, it goes back to that discernment and prayer what is it that I'm called to do? Which which side of this am I called to take? But mm-hmm. any which way you do it, to do it with love and respect. Mm-hmm. To not argue with their parent in a negative fashion. I mean, I think we can definitely debate. There's a difference between debate and argue. So to be respectful of their parent, even in the midst of standing firm in what they feel called to do. And that right there is a witness in and of itself. Really good. The attitude with which we approach all of this, so very important. Let's turn the advice the other way now. We've talked about the goer. What advice do you have for the parents of potential workers who are struggling with this, letting their children or maybe their grandchildren go to the mission field? You know, this is actually something that I struggled with uh, earlier in my life with my two older boys who were away from me for a little while due to kind of crazy circumstances because that's often what happens in reality, in real life, God graciously gave me a couple of chapters in the Bible that I clung to. And those are in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 1 through 3, pretty much, talking about Hannah. Hannah had prayed so desperately for a child, and she wanted a child. And yet, um, when she finally did, and God granted her this son, what did she do? She dedicated him to the Lord and gave him to a priest who was really a pretty awful priest and who had raised pretty awful sons. Mm -hmm. But yet Hannah trusted God to be in charge of her son. So if you are struggling or wrestling with sending your child off to a place that you don't have any say or control, it's a hard thing, but it's a true thing to remember that God is their father and their most loving father and protector that they could have. And really, it comes down to their heart issues. Some people still say, 
I just can't let my child go. And that really is understandable, but we need to start thinking about, you know, are you not letting go because you don't trust God? And that's really hard to bring up to someone, but if it's respectfully done and just say, you know, you need to think about trusting God with everything that we have and he will bless that. I often try and get them excited about the amazing things God's going to do for their child that I know that they love desperately and how God is going to work so brilliantly in their life and try and kind of put it, because I know that they care about their child. That's kind of why we're to this point of concern. Mm -hmm. Uh, So just trying to encourage them with how God is going to use their son or daughter to honor and glorify Christ and, and believing parents they get that. When you really get down to it, they get that. It's just a struggle that they have to they work, work through. In uh, my personal case, I remember being at the airport with my parents. They had come to send us off from uh, Ottawa, Ontario. They had actually visited the week before, and they were going home the day before we left for the field. And I remember standing at the airport, and my mom was holding our son, who was at that time 15 months old, just in that age where we could walk and say gammon, all that great stuff. And uh, it was in pre-9-11 days, so security wasn't as tight, but I could hear them calling my parents' flight. You know, Grant and Kathy, if you're hearing this, you need to come to your plane right now because we're, we're leaving. And how challenging it was when I had to say, Mom, I've got to take him. It wasn't because they didn't care. It wasn't because they didn't want us to follow God's purposes. It was just hard. We want to recognize and honor that the process of saying goodbye and releasing loved ones into this is a big deal. It's it's very important. And we want to do a good job as agencies of walking alongside as well. Here, Tiffany, I want to get to advice that you might have for churches and mission organizations who want to help workers and their families who are struggling through this. What advice do you have for us? Yeah, um, actually, in talking with our member care department, one of the things we've discussed is a new book that's been out. Uh, I have to admit, I haven't read it fully, so, uh, but it's called Mind the Gaps, and it's talking about engaging the church in missionary care because it's not just a biological family that sends, but it's a church family that sends. And that's often what we ask is, who is your church family? Are they behind you? Are they walking with you? So what I would suggest is is the church understanding that they are sending this person as well. It's not just the family, that they can ask the appointee, what can I pray for you with? What are you struggling with? How can we walk alongside you in this? Some churches, from what I've heard, actually have classes or, or seminars that really help the church to know how to walk alongside people who are being sent, to not be afraid to ask those parents or those children that are left behind questions Not you know, is it taboo? Are they hurting too much? Should I ask? Yeah, ask them, you know, commiserate with them on different things so they can know that they're not alone. Churches are the sending body. They need to recognize that And for their congregation or their local body of believers, find out who they are, you know, know what they need as a group, know your people and know what they need to serve them well. Mm -hmm. So my phone actually just went off. It's 10.02 where I am in uh, Mountain Standard Time. Mm -hmm. And our organization, particularly our mobilization, prays at 10.02 every morning. It's focused on Luke 10, 2, which says, pray for workers for the harvest. So we, every day, wherever we are, we stop and we pray for a minute for workers for the harvest. But we can easily add into the pray for the those left behind for workers of the harvest. It's, it's a bigger issue and a bigger category of people we need to pray for. So if, I would encourage you to join us at 10, 02 every morning, wherever you are, and, and pray for workers for the harvest. That's a great reminder. Well, this is a point I'll just mention if you're listening. There was a book mentioned there, and I'll just remind our listeners that we do take show notes, and you can find those on the website. Afterwards, we'll include that book, Mind the Gaps. Um, Here, I'll also mention a book that we use from Send, and we provide to all the parents of our workers called Parents of Missionaries. 
The subtitle is How to Thrive and Stay Connected When Your Children and Grandchildren Serve Cross-Culturally. Tiffany, we've just opened this conversation. There are lots of different trails we could take, but if our listeners wanted to learn more from you, is there a way that they can contact you or follow you? Absolutely. Um, you can always contact me at my email address, which is tgodby at gemission.com. I can always be reached as well through the website. We have uh, two websites, one of them that focuses mostly just on our opportunities, and that's gemadventures.com. And then we also have our overall website, which is gemission.org. And both of those websites, if you fill out uh, an inquiry, what we call it, so, you know, hey, I'm kind of interested in this opportunity, those come through my computer as well. So either which way, I would love to hear from you. Well, thank you so much for sharing this time with us and helping us discuss this a little bit with our audience. And thank you for being an organization that seeks to take great care of your workers as well as their families who send. Appreciate you being with us today. I appreciate it. And thank you very much for this opportunity and for all that Send does as well. Well, we hope that this episode has been helpful and has shone a bit more light on a difficult but really important topic. While we continue to ask the Lord to raise up and send out workers, we also need to be thoughtful about the families and extended families that are impacted by this decision. A couple of great books were mentioned as resources during the interview. Remember, you can find those in the show notes on the website at globalmissionspodcast.com. And as always, we would be grateful for your help in spreading the word and leaving a review on iTunes or Google Play. That really helps others decide if they'd like to give this podcast a try. That's all for today. The Global Missions Podcast is produced by the Joffrey Center for Global Initiatives and Send International of Canada in collaboration with other like-minded agencies. On behalf of our team, thanks for listening. Join us again in two weeks when we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth.